Good evening, everybody, to the thousands joining us live on Zoom, bit of an overstatement, to the millions joining us on YouTube, which in several years might be the case, you never know. Welcome, everybody, to Mishnah Mastery. Whee! Tonight, if we are lucky, we are going to plough through the final three chapters of Masechet Erevin. And it is going to be a big party for us all on Zoom. So do come along and join us. Uh, it's not too late. All right, here we go. We're going to get it up on the screen for you over here. And we are going to crack on. As I said, if you've got questions, please do chime in. And if you are burning out, then just let me know. Um, and we will adjust our game plan to suit you. How amazing is that? You know, this is a custom-made bespoke program. So, so there you go. We are going to start with... Chapter 8, talking about Erev Tachumin, the, uh, the 2,000 amot perimeter around a town. And the Erev, the, uh, the food that you would have to leave in order to be able to walk beyond the perimeter. So uh, the Erev Tachumin must be food for each individual person. So we're going to ask the following question as we start with Mishnah 1. Ketzad Mishnatvin Batchumin. How do we go about making the participation, the partnership, for the Erev Tuchumin? So the Mishnah says, A person should put down the barrel, um, or whatever the, the food is. It can be any type of food. Um, but the point is this, if it's his food, then he needs someone to acquire for, for, to, to acquire for everyone else who wants it. Um, but... But yeah, so if a person was aware before Shabbos that this food was going to be there, he can decide later whether or not he's going to partake of it. Uh, but he needs to be aware of what's going on. So the Mishnah says, He puts down the food, he puts down the jar, the barrel, whatever, the Omer, and he says, This is going to be for everybody in my town. For anybody who is going about to because they want to go to a house of mourning because they want to go to a house of feasting wherever it is they're going this is going to be um the air of tuchumim for them and that's um the reason for that or, or at least what we learn from here is that really one should only be going for these longer journeys if it's for a mitzvah um so that is why they make that statement anybody who accepts the Erev, for their usage over Shabbos, it's going to be mutter. It's going to be permitted for them to be able to partake of it. Mishetechshach, however, if it uh, is already after Shabbos has come in, when they want to be able to accept it, or when they become aware that there is an Erev for them to be able to utilize, so then the Mishnah says, also, it's going to be forbidden for them to benefit from it. Sheim ma'arvin mishetechshach, because they cannot accept the Erev, they cannot make the Erev, they cannot affect the Erev after it is already um, dark, after Shabbos has already come in. So the Mishnah says in Mishnah base, Kamahu shiura, how much do we have to be giving? What is the minimum measurement to be able to qualify as a valid Erev tachunim? The Mishnah says, Mazon shtei sudas lukonecha, there has to be enough food for each person to have two meals. So whereas previously we, uh, we had said an, uh, to be able to make an Erev for alleyways, we had said that it has to be an amount per um, alleyway. Um, this is different. This has to be for each person. And what we see is that this is interpreted differently by, e by different rabbis. So says Rabbi Meir, How big does this meal have to be? It has to be the size of a meal that you would eat during the week, but not for a meal you would eat during Shabbos. These are the words of Rabbi Meir. Why? Because Rabbi Meir says you eat less during the week than you do on Shabbos. So that is why you would go by the minimum quantity for a weekday meal rather than a Shabbos meal. Rabbi Yehuda, Omer, le Shabbos, Rabbi Yehuda says that you have to have enough food for a Shabbos meal and not for a weekday meal. Why does he say that? Because Rabbi Yehuda says that you have three meals over Shabbos, so you actually space yourself out and spread yourself out a bit more, and you eat a little less over Shabbos. Neither Rabbi Meir nor Rabbi Yehuda have ever been in my house for meals. Um, because then they would know that, yeah, we, do, we don't need to talk about how much Rabbi Nick eats. Anyway, so 
Those are the two positions. But the Mishnah is keen to point out the Zev Zev is covered in the Hakka. They're both trying to give it the most lenient approach. Um, Rabbi Meir saying you eat less during the week. Rabbi Yehuda saying you eat less on Shabbos. You just eat more times on Shabbos, but you eat less each time. So they're both trying to rule leniently. Rabbi Yochanan ben Baroka Omer, this is going to get a little bit mathematical now. So uh, you can always catch the recording if it's not um, if it's not clear to you the first time. It's a bit it's a bit like one of these um, you know like a number round on countdown over here. Here we go. Rabbi Yochanan ben Broker Omer. Omer. Rabbi Yochanan ben Broker says, "How much do you have to have there?" Mekika bepuntion me arba sin besela. You have to have enough the size of a loaf of bread that can be bought for a pundion. At a time when you can buy four se'a of flour for a seller. Did everyone get that? So it is a loaf of bread that can be bought for a pundian. So let's try and work that out. And by the way, the volume equals out to 12 eggs. Just to explain to you how we get to 12 eggs, the value of a seller, one seller, which is a type of coin, is worth 48 pundian. And we have to buy one loaf of bread for one pundian, which means that one pundian is one forty-eighth of four seta, which is one twelfth of a seta, and one seta equals 144 eggs, which means that 144 divided by 12 equals 12 eggs. So the volume that we're talking about over here, according to Rabbi Yochanan ben Baraka, is a loaf of bread, the volume of 12 eggs. Okay, um, the Gemara apparently modifies this to six eggs. Anyway, so says the Mishnah, Rabbi Shimon Omer, Rabbi Shimon says, Shte yados lakikar mishalosh lakar. It's a different size. It's actually two thirds of a loaf. Um, two thirds of a loaf when three loaves are made from a cup. Okay, so cup is a, is, a, is a measurement. So what we're saying is that it's two thirds, meaning... If a cove is 24 eggs worth and you're getting three loaves out of every cove, that means that one loaf is worth eight eggs. But you're only needing two thirds of a loaf, which means that you are looking at a volume of, according to Rabbi Shimon, five and one third eggs. All right. So uh, so that is that is uh, those are the measurements over there, says the Mishnah. Says Separately, we are um, tying this machlokes into different halachas, which also depend on these different calculations and different sizes. And uh, and so what we're being taught in this last part of the mission is as follows: that half, uh, half of a loaf, which is about three to four eggs, depending on how the machlokes works out between these two rabbis. So uh, that is the amount needed to be able to make a person tummy if they remain inside uh, the same space as somebody who is afflicted with leprosy, with saras, meaning that if you spend um, the amount of time it takes to eat half a loaf of bread, three to four eggs worth of bread, if you stay in a house or in a space with a leper, with a person who is afflicted with saras, if you spend that amount of time, you will contract tumor from that person. And similarly, similarly, if you spend the amount of time it takes to eat a quarter of a loaf of tummy food, um, then, so, or sorry, if you eat a quarter of a loaf of tummy food, then you are going to become invalidated from eating Turuma um, until you've gone to the mikvah. So those are the measurements that it's referring to at the end over there. So <clears throat> it's quite a complex machlokes, um, depending on how big your different sizes are, but that's that's what it's driving at. The same calculations are used to calculate how much time you have to spend in the proximity of a leper and how much time uh, oh, sorry, how much you have to eat before you become disqualified from eating Turuma. So that's Mishnah Days. Moving on to Mishnah Gimel, um, where we're going to see that uh, in, a, in a scenario of upper and lower courtyards, they're going to behave quite similarly 
to inner and outer courtyards that we have seen previously. So, says the Mishnah, If you have got residents of a courtyard and residents of a balcony, um, that they've forgotten to join up with each other, um, and so what impact is that going to have? So the Mishnah says, fundamentally speaking, anything that's higher than ten tefachim, in terms of height, is always going to um, be appropriate to the upper courtyard. Right? We've seen this in terms of the airspace of the public domain being ten tefachim. So let's see how it impacts this Mishnah over here. Says the Mishnah, uh, so they've forgotten the lot over, they haven't made a uh, an Arab together. Anything that is relating to higher than ten tefachim is going to um, belong to the residents of the balcony. But less than that, anything within um, ten handbreadths of the ground is going to belong to the residents of the courtyard. What about if you have got uh, a, a ditch? Or translates it here as a uh, as a system. Um, so, what if you've got something going down, or hasela, or you've got a rock going up? So the mission says, "Gavoy masara tefachim." If it's ten tefachim high, or, or the rim of this pit is ten tefachim high, then lamar peses. It's going to belong to the balcony. Pachos mikan lechatzer. But if it's lower than ten tefachim, it's going to belong to the courtyard. What, uh, what is this in relation to? Bismucha. This is in relation to things which are adjacent um, to the, um, the balcony, meaning that it's within four tfachim of the balcony. Aval bemufleges. However, if it's quite far away from the balcony, afilu gavoha asara tfachim lechatsa. Even if it's ten tfachim high, it's still going to belong and be relevant to the courtyard when it comes to being able to move things um, to and from it. What is then considered to be close enough to the um, to the balcony? As long as it's not more than four tfachim, more handbreadth, four handbreadths away from the balcony, it could be considered to be in the airspace or the proximity of the balcony if it's within four tfachim and if it's higher than ten tfachim in the air. Continuing with Mishnah Dalad, uh, where we're going to be dealing with where you must put the Eir of Chatzelos, the Eir of to be able to join the residents of the courtyard together. So it has to be with um, one of the residents in that courtyard. It has to be um, in one of those houses. So it says, but what we're going to see is what is considered to be a dwelling place. So says Mishnah Dalit, a person who puts his Eruv in a gatehouse, meaning that there's a space by the gate where somebody is living or spending time or guarding, whatever it might be. So that's where you put your Eruv. Or you put it in an Achsadra, which it translates here as, as a portico. Um, but I think what it means is kind of a, a, a porch with a, a shelter on top. Umar Preses, or you put it on the balcony. Eino Eruv, that is not going to count as an Eruv, because it's not a dwelling place. Vahadar Sham, Eino Oser Elav, and if you have someone who happens to be living in one of these places, Eino Oser Elav, then his, um, his uh, participation is not going to impact um, detrimentally to other people. Um, because if you recall, we've said in the past that if if someone doesn't join in with an era of chatzelus with a courtyard era, then it could have ramifications for others being able to carry in and out. Um, we saw that either last week or the week before. So somebody who lives in one of these non-dwelling places, it's not actually going to impact on others if they decide to not join in. Says the Mishnah though, the base hatevin. If you leave it, um, if you put the era in a straw shed, I think that's a shed for straw rather than a shed made out of straw. Or you leave it in a base habakar or a cattle shed, uba base ha'etzim or a wood shed. Uba be- yeah, yeah, I can't imagine we're trying to build sheds out of animals. Um, so these are talking about storage places for straw or for animals or for wood. Uba base or for any kind of storehouse. Hareza eruv. These are theoretically livable, dwellable um, structures. And so if you leave the eruv there, it is going to count. 
And that's why the Mishnah says the next the next clause, Vahadar Sham Osarlav, someone who lives in one of these huts is going to have an impact and potentially restrict and prohibit others from carrying if they don't participate, if they don't contribute to the aim, or they don't agree to it. Rabbi Huda says, Rabbi, uh, uh, Rabbi Huda Omer, Rabbi Huda says, In Yesh Sham Tafisas Yad Shel Bal Habayis, Eino Osa Allah. Rabbi Huda says that if a, um, if a person has ownership over a property, um, but that property might be rented out, so the householder, the owner, is not going to have um, is not going to have that level of ability to restrict and to prohibit uh, the other residents of the courtyard. So that is the end of Mishnah Dalit. Here we go with Mishnah Hay. Okay, fifteen minutes in. Let's go, guys. Mishnah Hay talking about what happens if someone is not home for Shabbos. Um, and we have to consider whether they are going to end up coming home or not. So says the Mishnah, Hamaniach es Beso, the person who leaves their house for Shabbos, they go away for Shabbos, Bahalach lishpos be Irakeris, and they go and spend Shabbos in another town. Echad Nochri, the Echad Yisrael, Hari is their Osa Divri Orimeh. Rabbi Meir has quite a strict um, position on this. Whether the person is a non Jew or whether the person is a Jew, he is going to prohibit the other residents from being able to carry if uh, they did not contribute to the Erev or if the non-Jew did not, you know, sell his rights over the courtyard. So Rabbi Meir has a very strong position on that. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Rabbi Yehuda says, Eino Osa, um, you do not, the, the, the resident that goes away is not going to impact on the others. He assumes that a Jew is not going to come back on Shabbos, in which case there would be no problems there. And according to Rabbi Yehuda, a non-Jew does not have to sell on his, uh, his rights if he is not going to be there. So he has a very lenient approach. Rabbi Yossi Omer, Rabbi Yossi says, Nochri Oseh. Rabbi Yossi says that maybe the, Jew will, the non-Jew will come back, and so you do still have to go through the process of getting the rights to the courtyard from him. But Yisrael Eina Oseh. But a Jew is not going to come back on Shabbos. She'ein derech Yisrael lavo b'Shabbos, because it is not it is not the way of a Jew to return on Shabbos. Rabbi Shimon Omer, Rabbi Shimon says, Afilu hiniach es beiso, even if he leaves his house, for halach lishpos etzel bito ba'osah ha'ir, even if he leaves and he's just going up the road, he's still in the same town, he's still in the same city, but he's just going to spend Shabbos with his daughter. Eino oser, he's also not going to um, cause the um, other residents to be prohibited. Shekvar his because he's already got it out of his heart that he's not going to be coming back. Interestingly, it does get picked up here that um, the Mishnah is clear to point out that it's only when you go to your daughter's house for Shabbos. Because I guess they assume that if you're going to your daughter-in-law's house Shabbos for Shabbos, it might not end so well, and so a person might still come back. But, uh, but no one's going to fall out with their daughter over Shabbos, according to, uh, to Rabbi Shiva. Um, all right, Mishnah Vav says the Mishnah talking about a ditch, a pit, and whether it's going to make the chutzer, the courtyard, as one, and how you can get water in and out of a pit or a, a hole that's filled with water. So let's let's take a little look at this. Says the Mishnah in Mishnah Vav, Bor Shabain Shte If you've got a pit of water, a ditch of water that is separating between two courtyards. Um, so says the Mishnah, You may not draw water from this space on Shabbos. Unless you have created a partition that is ten handbreadths high. Whether the partition is placed above the water level or the rim, or whether the, um, the partition is placed Below, being um, or whether it is, um, or whether it is from its rim, uh, is that Ogno or Osno? What does it say there? Ogno, yeah. Um, so, what are we saying over here? So, there has to be a partition protruding ten tefachim above the water, or there has to be ten tefachim going down into the pit. 
Um, so that is the clause in the Mishnah. Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel Omer, Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel says that Beis Shammai Omrim Milamata, Beis Shammai very clear that it has to be below the water, who Beis Hillel Omrim Milamala, Beis Hillel say that it has to be above the water. Omar, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda says, No partition can be more effective than a wall between the two courtyards. So if there is a wall between the two courtyards, it makes it like two, um, two courtyards, and then they will be able to draw water uh, respectively. Says the Mishnah in Mishnah Zayin. Amas Hamayin. Shehiyoveres Bechatev. You've got a... Uh, a channel, thank you. A water channel that is flowing through the courtyard. Um, and the point is that it's coming from outside your courtyard, through your courtyard, and then out of your courtyard again. Um, so this water is coming from outside of your property. But critically, critically, this water channel is four to fucking wide and it's ten to fucking deep. So it's like it's its own domain. Um, it actually has a status of a karmelis, which we've talked about in the past. So, says the Mishnah, You've got a channel of water that's flowing through your courtyard. So you're not allowed to fill up, um, you're not allowed to draw water from it. Unless you've made sure that there is a partition of 10 tzfachin at the entrance to the courtyard and the courtyard and the exit. Of your courtyard. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Rabbi Yehuda says, Kosel Shal Gaba Tidon Mishum Mechitza. That if you have a wall, so if you imagine for a second that you've got a hole at the bottom of the wall that the channel is passing through, but you know, you have a wall nonetheless at the entrance and the exit, Rabbi Yehuda says that that is going to count as your Mechitza, as your partition. So continues the Mishnah, Amar Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda says, Maase Ba'ama Shel Avel. There was a story like this regarding a channel. Um, in the city or the town of Avel. That the elders allowed people to be able to draw water from it. But they said to him that this was because the channel uh, was not the requisite size. It wasn't 10 to fucking deep or 4 to fucking across, and therefore it wasn't considered to be part of the river, and therefore it didn't have the status of the Karnavis, and that was why they were permitting it. Says the Mishnah in Mishnah Ches, we are dealing with a porch uh, or balcony over some passing water. So the, um, the problem that we have is you have to be able to make the area where the water is passing part of your domain to be able to draw water from it. So says the Mishnah, if you have a gazustra, you have a porch, you have a balcony, shehila mala min hamayim. With, or, or, or if you can, maybe picture also uh, uh, something over the canals of Venice, you know, something like that, where you've got your property is extending over the passing water. So, so, although why you'd want to draw water from canals of Venice, I don't really know. They're a bit filthy. Um, anyway, because this trashy lamalam in a mine, you are above water. You're not allowed to draw water from uh, from from your balcony on Shabbos. Unless you have created a uh, a box, essentially, um, that is ten to fucking high, in which case you can lower your bucket through that uh, that that uh, what we're going to call it that that box tube, and then through the whole of your balcony down to the water, and then you can draw it back up. So you can do it either from the top or being milamata, or you can concoct some kind of box situation funneling down below your balcony um, and then you'll be able to draw water. That's even if the uh, water level is still below, says the Mishnah. Um, so you have to have the mechitza, the partitioning um, area of ten to fucking high. Ben milamala, ben milamata has to be above it or below it. The chen shtei gazus mizu. And also if you have two balconies, one on top of the other, so, um, so, so says the Mishnah. Asula el Yona, the law asula tachtona, shtein asura san shia raven. If you do have two balconies, one on top of the other, they are going to have to club together to make an area. Otherwise, you are not going to be able to 
um, pull water through one um, one and the other. So um, that's how you would rectify the situation if you have got two balconies, one on top of the other. Um, fine, so that is Mishnah Ches. And now let's turn to Mishnah. Oh, sorry, we didn't have the English for that one. I apologize for that. No one. G give me a shout. If you have something to say, people, give us a shout. Don't be scared. Mishnah Tess. Dealing with a situation where you're in your courtyard and you're trying to dispose of water and it may flow into the public domain. Now, from a, strictly speaking, from a biblical point of view, this is going to be okay. But the rabbis for forbade it. The rabbis forbade spilling water in your courtyard and having it flow out to the public domain in case a person comes to spill on purpose out to the public domain. So biblically, it might be fine, but rabbinically, it's going to be a problem. So the other thing to bear in mind is that the courtyard, um, if it is larger than 16 amot squared, then you don't need to worry. But if it's less, then you do need to worry. And what we're going to see is, is that the person would have to dig a trough before Shabbos that can hold a certain amount of water, um, and then you'd be able to spill freely. So say, let's take a look at Mishnah Tess. Chatzer, shehi pechusa me'arba amos. If you have a courtyard which is smaller than four by four amos. Ein shofchin besorcha ma'in b'shabbos. So then you're not allowed to spill your water on the floor um, on Shabbos. Ela in kein, asu la'uka machazeches sasayim min hanekev ulamata. Unless you have a, a hole or a trough which can hold two se'a, um, which is approximately seven gallons, which is approximately X number of litres. Um, so, so that amount of water is the average amount that a person would use in the space of one day. So if you have created a trough in your courtyard that can hold that amount of water, then you would be allowed to pour water into the... Uh, into the courtyard. Says the Mishnah, whether the trough was outside or inside the courtyard. But if you put this hole outside of your courtyard, then you would need to have it covered. But if it's inside, then you, uh, then you don't have to cover it. So what we can picture over here is your hole kind of just outside the entrance to the courtyard, in which case you have to cover the first four amos into the public domain so that it is not, strictly speaking, considered the public domain and then the water can drain can drain through into uh, into that area. So, Mishnah Yud, 10th Mishnah, 28 minutes in. Let's go, guys. Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov, Aimeh, Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov says that if you have a biv, if you have a gutter, shehu kamo, which is covered. If you have a, a sewage drain, it translates it there as, which is covered for amos, arba amos gershus rabin. It's covered for amos into the public domain. It says the Mishnah, shofchin l'soichay ma'im b'shabbos, and you're allowed to pour water into it on Shabbos. V'chachamim ma'amrim afilu gag, or chatzer me'er ama. Even if you have a roof or a courtyard, which is a hundred Amos in uh, in surface area, you're not allowed to pour directly into it um, if it's going to flow into the public domain. But they do say, the Chachamim say you may pour from roof to roof, and the water can flow into the strain, that's going to be okay. And then the Mishnah finishes off. A courtyard and a porch, mitzdarf in the other amos, they're going to all add up to this uh, space of four amos to be able to um, effect the permutations that we've been discussing and the permutations that we've been talking about to be able to pour water in this area. Finally, final, ch uh, final mission of chapter eight. Uh, similarly, let's go down, people. If you have two, um, I've got it translated here as rows of buildings, 
here in the screen it translates as two storied buildings so you have two houses basically um, without a joint Erev Chatzeros right so we have these two houses Zukanegedzu this one they are opposite each other Miktsasan Asu Uka U Miktsasan Lo Asu Uka so one of the residents of these houses has made a trough that we've talked about and the other did not says the Mishnah Asu Uka Mutarin then the ones who made the trough are permitted to pour out their water. But the ones who did not um, make the hole, make the trough, make the ditch, then they are not allowed to do that. Mazel Tov completing chapter 8. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we shall move on to chapter 9, assuming everyone is still hanging in there. It's only a short one, which is why, if we're lucky, we should be able to, uh, to crack through. So, continuing with the details of an era of Chatseris, of the era for courtyards. So, um, let's have a look at Mishnah Aleph. A roof is technically a private domain. Um, but we see that there is some disagreement as to how this ends up functioning um, practically. Says the Mishnah, Kol Gagos Ha'ir, all of the roofs of a town, Rishus Achas are really one big private domain. Uvilvashal, assuming, by the way, that we're talking about flat roofs, jumping from one to the next, uh, moving from one to the other, and it's all kind of connected. So that's the premise that we're building on when we say that it is all one domain. Says the Mishnah, Uvilvash, Shalo Yehegach, Gavoha, Asara, or Namuch, Asara, Divri Rabbi Meir. The Rabbi Meir says, a very strict opinion, as long as you're not having to ascend or descend Ten to fachin to get to the next neighboring roof. Say the chachamim, chachamim omim, call echad ve echad rishus bifneyatsma. Each um, and every one of these roofs is its own domain. Let's try the same page. Continuing with um, Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Shimon omer, echad gagos ve echad chatseros ve echad karpefos, rishus achad lechelim shishavsu the sofa that whether we're talking about roofs, whether we're talking about courtyards, whether we're talking about carpathos, which are these wooden fenced in areas that we saw a few chapters ago, um, they are all considered one rishus um, for kalim that were there before Shabbos. Because one of the fundamental principles is that an item which was in a courtyard or one of these spaces before Shabbos can be carried to another chatzer without an Erev. So the Erev is only facilitating being able to carry things from a house that are, there, that are in a house on Shabbos and you need to take them to a courtyard or you need to take them to another courtyard or whatever it is. So if you have an item that was already outside in a courtyard before Shabbos or um, in, uh, on a roof or in one of these wooden fenced enclosures, then you'll be able to transfer from one to the other on Shabbos but they won't be considered one big domain if you are taking something from your house to move it to somewhere else. In that case, you do need an Erev, says the Mishnah. Moving on to Mishnah base, dealing with a situation where no Erev Chatzeris was made. Says the Mishnah, Gag Gadol Samach Lakata. So this one, I've been trying to wrap my head around it a little bit, but it is quite confusing. Gad gadol samuch lekatan. If you have a large roof, right? Again, we're dealing with flat roofs over here. That's the easiest way to picture it. So flat, uh, a large flat roof that is adjacent to a smaller roof. Says the Mishnah, hagadol muta, the hakatan asur. The bigger one is going to be permitted to carry from the house to the roof, um, but not for the smaller one. Um, if you want to be able to carry to the smaller one, then there needs to be a kind of joint area between the two properties. And my understanding of this is that the larger roof is going to be viewed as a distinct separate area, whereas the smaller roof is going to be, view, be viewed as being in relation to the bigger space. So it's going to be like a communal chatzer there, in which case it requires an area to be able to move from one to the other. 
says the Mishnah, If you have a large courtyard that opens out into a smaller courtyard, so within the entranceway, the side of the entranceway, there's still going to be wall space inside the big courtyard. But as far as the smaller courtyard is concerned, it's going to be viewed as completely open on one side. Right, so that's the implication here. A big courtyard still has the wall space either side of the entrance, but a small courtyard is going to look as if it's an entirely open, there's no fourth side or third side to the to the courtyard. So chatzer, uh, a big courtyard that opens out into a small courtyard, says the Mishnah Hagadola Muteres, the, the larger courtyard is going to be permitted as its own area, but the smaller one is going to be forbidden. Because it's basically just viewed as the entrance to the larger one. So if you want to be able to carry in the smaller courtyard, then you'll have to have a shared Eiv. If you have a courtyard that opens out into a public domain, says the Mishnah, somebody who brings in to the private domain, or or someone who brings from the private domain into the courtyard, Chayav divrei Rabbi Eliezer. Rabbi Eliezer says um, that if it completely opens out into the public domain, it will be viewed as a public space. The Chachamim Omrim, the Chachamim say, Mitoicha lirushus harabim, or merushus harabim l'soicha patur, mitneshi kakamis. The Chachamim say that it is not a public domain, it would actually be viewed as a karmelis, and therefore you are not going to be chayav if you carry from one to the other, you are going to be putted. Still not allowed, but you're not going to have to bring a korban if you make that mistake. Moving on to Mishnah Gimel. What happens if the wall breaks in the corner of a courtyard? Which means that you now have openings on two sides of your courtyard. So we're going to see that it has a din now of a public space. If it, uh, if it is breached 10 amos across the corner, it is going to be viewed as a public space. Says the Mishnah, If you have a breach in your courtyard uh, from two sides, or if you have your house, which is uh, the walls are breached from two sides, or you have an alleyway where the crossbeam or the side post has been removed, it's going to be okay if that happens on Shabbos to carry on using as it as you have been, um, but in the future you're not going to be allowed to carry in and out unless you fix those um, those situations. Divrei Rabbi Yehuda. That is the position of Rabbi Yehuda. Rabbi Yosi Omer in Mutar la Osu Shabbos Mutar la Asid Lava. The Nasser la Asid Lava Asur la Osu Shabbos. He has uh, a different opinion. Rabbi Yosi says that if you're allowed to still move comfortably. Um, within it on Shabbos, then that's going to be the case for future weeks as well. But if you're not able to, then um, then it's not going to work for that week either. Once it's breached, it's breached. If it's not breached, then it's not breached, according to Rabbi Yossi. I believe the halacha in this instance is like uh, Rabbi Yossi. Final missionary in Perak Test, final missionary in Chapter 9. Habone a'o, scroll down. Habone alia al gabe shnei if you build an upper room, an attic, on the top of two houses, similarly, if you have two gesharim um, mufulashim, which um, it translates it here as a viaduct, I would have translated it as some kind of open, exposed bridge. Rabbi Yehuda says you may carry underneath these spaces on, um, on Shabbos. The Chachamim Oshim, the Chachamim prohibit this. The Oda Ma Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda says, further, Ma Arvin Lama Voi Hamafulash, the Chachamim Oshim. Rabbi Yehuda says that you can make an Erev for a, uh, a, an, an open alleyway on both sides. So, um, for example, a tunnel, you know, well, um, yeah, a, a tunnel or an alleyway that's open from two sides, then. Um, you can utilize, as we saw in the very, very first Mishnah, either the cross beam or the side post, you'll be able to make an Erev 
um, for a, an, an alleyway open from two sides, but the Chachamim forbid this. Okay. Mazel tov. On completing Mishnah Tess. We've done two chapters. That's our usual limit. Put your thumbs up in the air or give us a wave if you're okay to plow through the 10th chapter and complete Maseches Erevin tonight. Give us a wave if you're okay with that. All right. And if you do need to leave, then uh, I won't be offended. You can always catch it on uh, on, on on Bushy Shul Plus One. Um, so if you do, have you got a question, Dad? No. Okay. I can't. I can't hear. It's no use talking to me. You're muted. Now, let's finish Maseches Erevin. But not only that, let's finish Maseches Shabbos because, as we've said previously. Maseches Shabbos and Maseches Eruvin are kind of viewed as this whole grand corpus of the laws of Shabbos. And actually, we're going to be delving again into some more laws of Shabbos that are not strictly to do with Eruvin necessarily. So, um, so here's what we're trying to deal with. On Shabbos, Tefillin, are they considered forbidden biblically or are they considered forbidden rabbinically? Well, it would seem that that is not universally agreed upon. So what if you find tefillin in a place where they are not going to be protected? Says the Mishnah. If you find tefillin in a place where they are not going to be protected um, and they're not going to be safe over Shabbos, then the first position in the Mishnah says you can bring them in one pair at a time. Rabbi Gamliel says, Shnaim Shnaim. Rabbi Gam- Rabban Gamliel says you can bring them in two pairs at a time. Because, Rabban Gamliel says, they are forbidden biblically. You can't be doing a mitzvah with them on Shabbos. And so if you put them on, you're wearing them as an adornment. You're wearing them like jewellery. And if you're wearing them like jewellery, then in theory there is space. When we say you can bring them in, it means you can wear them. So... The first position says you can put on one pair and wear them inside or bring them in. And Rabban Gamliel says you can wear two pairs at a time. Because if you're wearing them as an adornment, then theoretically you can get two to fill in within the space of your arm, two to fill in within the space of your head, and therefore you can bring two in at once. Says the Mishnah though, Bamed Varimamurim, what are we referring to here? By Shams. Then we're talking about old ones. Aval Bachadashos Pato. But if you are talking about new to fill in, then you're going to be putter because you could confuse them for an amulet, apparently, which we've talked about previously. Says the Mishnah, If you found them arranged in a certain way, uh, which makes it look like they were put there on purpose, then the Mishnah says, Then you should leave them there until dark, keep them, you know, stay by them and keep them safe. And then after Shabbos, you should bring them in. But if it's a danger to do that, then you should just cover them up and walk away. That is the din in the first Mishnah of chapter 10. Moving on to Mishnah Base. Um, what's interesting about Mishnah Base is that Rabbi Shimon is going to be addressing a position um, which is anonymous um, and which we don't seem to actually have in our Mishnah. Um, and that opinion is, is that you can carry items for up to four amulets and then put them down. So that is what Rabbi Shimon is carrying, is, is commenting on, but we don't actually see that position explicitly stated in the Mishnah. So Rabbi Shimon Omer, Rabbi Shimon says, no non l'chavero, you should, get, you should give them to your friend, to another person, l'chavero l'chavero, and then they should pass it to another person, ad shimagia l'chatze hachit sona. So it's almost like Rabbi Shimon is commenting on a position that said you can carry them up to four amas at a time, put them down, and then do that again. Four amas, four amas. And he's saying you shouldn't do that by yourself, but it's okay to pass it to somebody else within four amas. And then to do and then pass it on to someone within four amas. And then someone else. Until you reach um, a courtyard, um, and then you'll be able to put them in safely. So Rabbi Shimon is saying it's preferable to use many people rather than to use one person. Um, so that's why that little bit of the Mishnah there uh, is confusing, as it all is, but that bit, that bit in particular. 
says the Mishnah, V'chein b'no. Similarly, the same is going to be the case for your son, for a child. Um, if you need to get your son from one place to the next, better that you should pass it to a hundred people, to a chain of a hundred people, rather than for one person to carry it for uh, less than four amas, put it, put it down, put him down, lift him up, do it again. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, no saying Adam Chavis Lechavera. Rabbi uh, Rabbi Yehuda says you should pass um, a barrel or a jar to his fellow. The Chavera Lechaveru, and then keep the chain going. Afinu Chutz Litzchon, even if the jug is now going to go beyond two thousand Amos. Amru Lo Lo Sahalech Zayosem Miragle Baaleha. But the Chachamim say they responded to him and they said that's not the case. It must not go further than the um, than the feet of its owner, meaning it must not go beyond two thousand amos. Mishnah Gimel, by way of introduction to Mishnah Gimel, if a portion, if a bit of something rolls beyond your domain, it is permitted biblically to bring it back as long as you're still holding the other side. But if you moved, um, so so that is going to have relevance to the following din in this Mishnah. Says the Mishnah, Haya Kari Basefa and Hai Skupa. If you are reading a scroll, if you're reading your sefer um, on the porch of your house, Nisgalgal Hasefa Miado, and the scroll rolls out of your hand and starts rolling away, Gorama Etzla, then you are allowed to roll it back in. So even though it extended beyond um, the domain and into the um, into the public domain, your porch, which is like a carmelis. Um, the Mishnah says you'll be able to roll it back in. But, says the Mishnah, if you're re- reading on the top of your roof, the Nisgalgal HaSefer Miyado, and the scroll falls out of your hands, then as long as this scroll has not reached the last tenth Fachim, closest to the ground, airspace to the ground, then the Mishnah says, then you can roll it back. But if it reaches within ten tefachim of the ground, says the Mishnah, then you should turn it over, which keeps it safe um, and, and should keep it protected. But you're not going to be allowed to roll it back in. Rabbi Yehuda, I mean, Rabbi Yehuda says, Even if it's just a hair's breadth away from the ground, if it hasn't touched the ground, then then you can roll it back up, even if it falls within ten tefachim of the ground. Rabbi Shimon, I know Rabbi Shimon says, that's not Golanoyetzlo. Rabbi Shimon says, even if, you, if it's fallen to the ground, you would still be allowed to roll it back up. Because we have to prioritize um, and we have to uh, maintain the sanctity and treat with dignity our holy writings. And so in such an instance, you would be allowed, according to Rabbi Shimon, to roll it back up again. Mishnah Dalit. <clears throat> um, now, Mishnah Dalit says as follows: Ziz shilifnei achalon. If you have got a ledge in front of your window, says the Mishnah, nosen in alav and notlin b'men b'shamis. Then you're allowed to put objects on it, and you're allowed to take objects off it on shamis. Um, says the Mishnah, Omed Adam b'yoshus hayachid. A person may stand in a private domain. And move objects in a public domain. Or you could stand in the public domain um, and move items inside the public domain. As long as you don't move them beyond four amos. So we're not transferring um, domains over here. We're not trying to bring things from one side to the other. And we're also not trying to move four amots within that domain. But says the Mishnah, in such an instance, you'd be allowed to move things around, even if you are standing, um, or your feet are standing, in the domain of, or, or in a different domain. Says the Mishnah, Mishnah, hey, things which are tantamount to throwing. What is the din? Lo yamod adam v'yashtin a person may not stand in a private domain and urinate uh, out into the public domain. 
because that's like throwing items. Are you also not allowed to urinate standing in the public domain into the private domain? You're also not allowed to spit from one domain to the other. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Rabbi Yehuda says, even if you've got spit in your mouth, you're not allowed to walk Arba Amas, according to uh, Rabbi Yehuda, um, unless you have first spat out. So I guess if you're walking in the public domain, we're not just talking about normal saliva, we're talking about a build-up of saliva inside your mouth, according to Rabbi Yehuda, you won't be allowed to walk for Amas unless you had first spat the saliva out. Moving on to Mishnah Vav. Lo yamod adam a person is not allowed to stand in a private space, v'yishter b'yoshus harabim, and drink in the public domain, meaning that their feet are in one place, leaning over to drink in another place, wouldn't be allowed to do it, says the Mishnah. B'yoshus harabim v'yishter b'yoshus hayachid. You wouldn't be allowed to stand in the public domain and drink in the private domain. Elayim kein hichnis rosho barubo l'makom shushose. Unless his head and the majority of his body is in the same domain, the same space as the drink. The chen bagas, similarly concerning a wine press. What is this talking about? It's actually nothing to do with the laws of Shabbos. What it's saying is that while you are in the space of the threshing floor, or you are in the vat of where the wine is being um, crushed, so you're actually allowed to have little tastes of the food or little tastes of the drink um, before separating Taruma and, uh, and tithing the tithes. So what this is saying is, even if your head and the majority of your body is in the space of this produce and you haven't done the separations yet, you would be allowed to have a little nibble and a little taste um, from those items. Continuing with the Mishnah, Kolet Adam Min You are allowed to collect water. See the uh, association between the word collect and collect. So you're allowed to catch this water, Min from a gutter, as long as you are intersecting it um, within 10 Tafakhin of the ground, once it's in the airspace of the, uh, the public domain. Umin Hatsinor, and you're also allowed to um, get the water from a water spout, from, a, from also a gutter which is protruding from the house, Mikol Makom Shosa. You'd always be allowed to get it from any um, place within such a, um, what, what are we calling it? A water spout. Okay, Mishnah Zion. Um, talking about a window over Rishus Harabim, over a public domain, with a pit directly below. And that pit is considered to be a private domain because it has walls and it has an embankment, which means that the pit is ten to fucking deep. Says the Mishnah, Borbrishus Ha Rabin, if you have a pit in the public domain, and the rib is ten to fucking high, so it's like its own domain now. If you have got a window that is overlooking this pit, you would be allowed to fill up, you'd be allowed to draw water from that pit on Shabbos, even though you've got the public space in between. Similarly, if you have got a garbage heap, a mound of rubbish out in the public space beneath your window, you might want to close your window, but nonetheless, you'd be allowed to pour water and throw things out into this space, even though it's into the public domain, that particular place is considered a private domain, and so you're not going to violate um, the, uh, the transference from one domain to the other. Mishnah Ches. <clears throat> Talking about carrying and sitting uh, under a tree. And whether the tree is considered to be a private space or not. So what we're going to see is if, that the, le if the leaves are drooping downwards and are within three tafakhim of the ground... So think of it, for example, uh, like a nice willow tree. Um, then those leaves will be forming a wall. Because within three tafakhim, we um, follow the principle of lavud, which closes the gap of three tafakhim and makes it like a wall. 
And so it's going to make it like a, a private domain. Now, there is a caveat that uh, if the branches are able to move around in the wind, then it's not a valid thing. So we are talking about heavy, tr heavy branches, or we're talking about tight branches that are tied down so they're not blowing around. So in such an instance, that's going to be considered a private domain. Says the Mishnah. Mishnah Ches. Ila, shehu meitech ala aretz. A tree that is spreading. Let's scroll down. Hey, come on. If a tree is spreading down um, over the ground, it's overhanging, overshadowing the ground. Says the Mishnah. Im ein nofo gavoha min ha'aretz shlosh tefachim. If the branches are within three tefachim of the ground, metaltalin tachtaf, then you can carry within the uh, the confines of this tree. Sharashab gavoha min ha'aretz shlosh tefachim. If the roots are extruding, protruding, if they are protruding three tefachim out of the ground, says the Mishnah, lo yeshevalein, and you should not sit on them because um, they are going to be um, part of the tree and not part of the ground. Hadeles shabamukza, if you have got a shed door, is that what it shows it? No? Okay. Hadeles shabamukza, if you have a, a, a door to a shed, vachadakim shabapirza, or you have thorns, in the breach of a wall, umachat salos, and you have reed mats, ain noalin bahem. You can't make, you can't use them for makeshift doors. I'm not sure why you would want to, but um, but you are not allowed to use them for makeshift doors because it will look too much like boner. Ela in ken gavohim in eyes, unless they are high off the ground, in which case it won't look like boner, it won't look like building if you use these. Says the Mishnah. How are we doing, guys? Going for quite a while. Should we keep on going? Yeah, Let's do it! Moving on to Mishnah Tess. Moving on to it, Mishnah Tess. Are we concerned that if he is leaning in to open a door with a key, that he is going to end up bringing the key into a different Rishas? That is the background to Mishnah Tess. Lo ya'amod adam b'rishas ha'yachid v'yiftach b'rishas ha'rabin. Person should not stand in the private domain and open a door in the public domain. Should not stand in your public domain and open the door in the private domain. This, by the way, is the reason why um, we had always said that in a place without air, you should have your key attached to the key belt when you open the door. Because if you take off the key belt in your driveway and your driveway is not actually enclosed, then you know, you, you lose the whole point of the key belt because now you're carrying in the public space, opening the door, and then taking it into a, a private space by opening the door. So uh, one has to be careful in such an instance. Unless, of course, though, you have created a, uh, a private space of um, a partition of 10 handbreadths high. Amrullah, they said to him, there was a story that took place in the marketplace um, in Jerusalem of the animal fatteners. <laughs> that they would lock up their shops and they would leave the key in a window on top of the shop door. Um, and I think that's saying that they did it because it was allowed, I'm guessing. Rabbi Yossi, I'm shook shot some he says, oh, that wasn't, that wasn't the animal fatteners, that was them wool dealers. Um, those were the ones who, who did it. Um, so one second. Yes, yeah, so I'm thinking, I'm thinking that they were doing it because um, these spaces were considered a karmelis, and so they were. That's that's what they would do in those spaces. Moving on to Mishnah Yud, talking about a door bolt. A door bolt is that considered a kli or not? Says the Mishnah. Neger, a door bolt, shiesh barosha glustra, which has at one end of it a ball or a knob, something that turns it into a useful vessel says that uh, beyond just its function as a doorknob. So says the Mishnah Rabbi Eliezer, Ose, Ose. Rabbi Eliezer forbids you to be able to move it. But Rabbi Yossi Matir, and Rabbi Yossi permits it. 
Amar Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Eliezer says, My said the Knesset Shiva Tiberia, Shahayu Nohagin Boheta. The uh, the shul in Tiberias, they would allow being able to use um, use this thing <clears throat> or to move this thing. Until Rabban Gamliel and the elders came along and forbade being able to move one of these door bolts. Rabbi Yosi Omer Isu Nahagubar. Rabbi Yosi said they treated it as forbidden, which is not the same thing as forbidding it. Bar Rabban Gamliel Vazakein Vehetu. Sorry. The, originally, the people in Tiberias forbade the use of it, but then But then they actually um, came along and permitted to be able to use it. Mishnah Yud Aleph, Mishnah Eleven, says the Mishnah. Well, by background, by way of introduction to this Mishnah, it would seem that. When working in the Beis Hamikdash, there were certain things that would be allowed within the confines of the temple that wouldn't be allowed outside of the temple. And the reason for that is because there were more people to monitor the situation and more people there to make sure that no mistakes were made. So the Mishnah says, Neger Hanigra. If you have got um, a bolt, a door bolt that drags along the ground, Says the Mishnah, no in Boba Mikdash, you would be allowed to use that to lock on Shabbos um, inside the temple of Aloba Medina, but not outside of the temple. The reason for that is because there would be more people to um, make sure that there were no violations um, going on. Vahamunach, and if the door bolt was resting on the ground, then come the Kalasa, then they would not allow it. Um, so the point here is that if it's um, die if it's tied to the door, then you could use it for locking the thing. But if it, I believe if it was loose then um, then it's a different story. Rabbi Yehuda Omer Hamunach Mutaba Mikdash. Rabbi Yehuda says that if it was placed on the floor, then you'd be allowed still to use it in the in the temple. And by way of extension, this dragging bolt would be allowed to use. Vahanigraba Medina. And the dragging bolt you'd be allowed to even use outside of the temple as well. But something that was still placed on the floor outside of the temple, that would not be permitted for use. Mishnah, your base. Other things that might have been allowed in the temple, but not outside of the temple. Machazirin tzir hatachton shabamikdash. You would be allowed to reinsert the bottom hinge um, of a door in in the temple of Bamadina, but not outside of the temple. Behaelion kam the kanasa, but the upper hinge, um, which would require more effort, um, such as hammering, to be able to get it into place. Then the Mishnah says, Come the Kanasu, you would not be allowed to do that in the temple either. Rabbi Huda Omer, Ha'elion Bamikdash, the Elyon, the upper one, would be allowed to be reinserted in the temple because, again, there would be people making sure that you're not violating Shabbos in any way. But outside of the temple, um, you would not be allowed to do it. But you would be allowed to return the lower one outside of the temple, according to Rabbi Huda. Just a couple more go to go, guys. Mishnah Yud Gimel, Mishnah 13, Machazir Ratiya Bamigdash, you would be allowed to reapply, replace a bandage, a plaster um, on Shabbos in the temple, Avalob Medina, but not outside of the temple. The reason for that is, um, the reason why you would need to not have a bandage on is because a Kohen would not be allowed to serve in the temple um, if they had a bandage on. So they'd be allowed to put it on and take it off on Shabbos. But outside of that, it would be forbidden because it would look like uh, refu, it would look like healing. In Batchila, if it was at the outset, then come the Kan Asa, then you would not be allowed to do it in the temple or without uh, or um, or outside of the temple. Says the Mishnah, Kosher Nima Bamikdash, you'd be allowed to tie the harp string um, in the temple, of Allah Bamadina, but you'd not be allowed to do that outside. In Batchila Kam Kanasa, but if you're doing that at the beginning, at the outset, then it would be prohibited to do it in both locations. Chos Chin Yabeles Lamikdash, you'd be allowed to cut off a wart 
because a Kohen would not be able to serve if he had a blemish like a wart. So you'd be allowed to cut it off to be able to serve in the um, in the Mikdash, a Valoba Medina, but not if you're outside of the temple. The Imbikli. So the point is you can cut it off unprofessionally, but if you are cutting it off professionally with an instrument, then Kanvikanasu, you'd not be allowed to do that even in the temple. Continuing with Mishnah Yud Dalit. Kohen Shalaka Ba'ithar, Kohen who had a wound on his finger, um, meaning a wound on his left hand, the finger on his left hand, so he doesn't need that finger for um, for serving for service in the temple. So he would be allowed to cover it up, cover up the wound so he can't see it during service. It says the Mishnah, Kohen Shalaka Ba'ithar, oh, if he had a wound on his finger, Kohen Shalaka Ba'ithar, Gemi Mikdash. You'd be allowed to tie a reed bandage around it, but not outside of the temple. If the intention was to be able to draw blood, um, you would not be allowed to do that in any place because that is going to be wounding on Shabbos, which is not allowed. Says the Mishnah. You'd be allowed to throw salt on the altar in the Mikdash in order that people should not slip. And you would also be allowed to draw water by means of a wheel or by means of the cisterns um, on Shabbos. And and you'd be able to draw on Yom Tov from the fresh water well in the centre of Yerushalayim, which was there for the uh, travellers to be able to enjoy when they were coming for Yom Tov. So you'd be able to draw cold water from that well on, Sha- uh, on Yom Tov. Says the Mishnah, is this the final one? Wow! Wow, guys! Here we go! Wake up, everyone! Final Mishnah of Maseches Erevin. What happens if you find a source of Tumah oh, in the base of Mikdash? What are you going to do? Oh my goody gosh! Sheretz Shanimsa Bamikdash. If you find a dead creeping thing in the temple, what are you going to do? Says the Mishnah, Then the Kohen should take it out, carry it out inside his belt, and it's not going to the tummy him. It's not going to um, make him impure if he carries it in his belt. The belt will become tummy, but the belt is not going to contaminate him. Says the Mishnah, he should do carry it out in his belt. In order that the impurity should not remain in the temple any longer than is necessary. Divrei Rabbi Yochanan ben Baruka. These are the words of Rabbi Yochanan ben Baruka. Continues the Mishnah. Rabbi Huda Omer. Rabbi Huda says, "Bitzvah shall eat." You should use a wooden pair of pliers, a wooden pair of tongs. Shalol Rabbi says in order to not increase the number of things being contaminated. So. According to the first position, it was better just to get it out there, even though the belt becomes tame. According to Rabbi Yehuda, it's better to use wooden tongs, which won't be contaminated. And that way you can take a little longer if needs be, but at least you're using something that's not going to become tame. Mehichan Motsiloso. From where should you get rid of it? Says the Mishnah, Mina Heichal, Umina Ulam, Umibena Ulam, Belam is Beach, Tivri Rabbi Shimon Ben Nana. Rabbi Shimon Ben Nana says, you get rid of it from the sanctuary, you get rid of it from the hall, you get rid of it from between the hall and the altar, you just get rid of it. Rabbi Akiva Omer, Makom Shechayavim al Zadon Akaris, Mal Shigagasa Chatas, Misham Lotsino. So you only need to get rid of um, of um, this Sheretz if it's in a place where Kares is going to be the penalty for anyone who goes in on purpose to one of these places. And a chatas, a korban chatas, if you enter by accident, from those places it should be removed. But the rest of the places on the Temple Mount, kofin alav, pesach der, then you should just cover it with a large pot. Rabbi Shimon, I know, Rabbi Shimon says, makom shiritu l'chachamim, any place where the chachamim have permitted you, mishel cha nasnu lach, then um, they have only given you what is really yours. Then they, it's because they have only um, permitted that which is uh, is forbidden midrabbanon rabbinically. So the truth is that I think the Gemara says we're unclear as to exactly what he is referring to, but it seems to be harkening back to um, an opinion that he had 
at the end of um, the fourth chapter. So a bit of an obscure ending to um, Maseches Erevin over there. But for further research, do um, learn the Gemara. Uh, we're going to be starting it very soon in Dafyomi, so please feel free to join me on a Sunday morning for those weekly shurim. But for now, ladies and gentlemen, join me as we say, Salik Maseches Erevin, Salik Maseches Erevin, Salik Maseches Erevin, Mazel Tov, everybody, on completing Maseches Erevin. Tune in next time when we will be starting Psachim. And that's all for this week. Wish you all a good night and wonderful and meaningful week. Take care, everyone, and 